This is Mark from Team How To, and we're teaching the masses how to. Hey guys, today I want to give a deeper explanation of the compressor effect in Audacity. I see a lot of videos out there saying, hey, this is how you should set it, but I don't really see anybody actually breaking it down and explaining what it is or why. So let's get a, let's get a little background on this. To use this feature, you generally want to come in, highlight the area you want to affect, go to your effects, and scroll on down to compressor. So here we have a lot of different settings, a lot of different things. Let me just go through a little bit. Basically, the compressor effect reduces the dynamic range of audio. One of the main purposes of reducing the dynamic range is to permit the audio to be amplified further without clipping than it would otherwise be possible. Therefore, by default, the compressor amplifies audio as much as possible after compression. This can be useful for audio played in a noisy environment, such as a car or in a speech, and it could also make a distant voice sound as loud as a close one. Because the gain changes relatively slow, a compressor does not distort the signal in the way that a limiter or clipping would do so. Now that we have a little bit better understanding exactly what the compressor is, let's go into each of these settings. We'll start with threshold here at the top. The threshold is the level above which the compressor is applied to the audio. To break that down a little deeper, uh, the threshold is the volume level at which the compressor starts to be applied. Therefore, when any of the levels reach that threshold, it will start pulling them down and won't let them get past there. Most people will recommend a minus 12 to a minus 20 dB for the threshold. Next thing down is the noise floor. The noise floor is the level of background noise in a signal or the level of noise introduced by the system where the signal being captured can't be isolated from the noise. The compressor adjusts the gain on audio below the background level so as to prevent it from being unduly amplified in processing. This is mainly useful when compressing speech to prevent the gain increasing during pauses and thus over amplifying the background noise. What's best for me may not necessarily be best for you in the noise floor. It really depends a lot on the ambient noises in the background and where you're at. Uh, negative 40 is a very common place to start and you might try adjusting up or down accordingly. Now the next setting down is the ratio. What this one is is fairly simple. The In this case I've got this set at negative 13 dB. Anything that happens in the compression beyond the negative 13 dB, this is at what factor that will be compressed. Say for instance I have a negative 13 dB, the, some of my spikes run up to a negative, say negative 19 dB, which is 6 dB higher. The 3 to 1 compression, we would take the 6 dB that it's higher than the 13 and divide that by the 3 to 1, and that would be 6 divided by 3, so 2. So you would have a 2 decibel compression on that spike. So if you wanted that higher or lower, you could adjust that accordingly. Okay, so the next setting down is the attack time. The attack time is how soon the compressor starts to compress the dynamics after the threshold is exceeded. If the volume changes are slow, you can push this to a high value. Short attack times will result in a fast response to sudden loud sounds, but will make the changes in volume much more obvious to listeners. So I don't suggest getting too high of a number here. So personally, I would start this at a point two, and if you start noticing quick fluctuations in your sound, you might try to run this down a little bit from there. The next setting down is the release time. And this is how soon the compressor starts to release the volume level back to the normal level after it drops below the threshold. A long time value will tend to lose quiet sounds that come after loud noises, but will avoid the volume being raised too much during short quiet sections like pauses in speech. The next setting down is this checkbox for makeup gain for 0 dB after compressing. All that does is simply does the amplifying effect as if you were to go in and do it after the fact, but by checking this it does it automatically for you, which in most cases I would suggest doing. And that basically amplifies the resultant audio in the selected tracks after compressing to the peak level of 0 dB, which is the default and it's what I usually use unless I have a good reason not to. And the last setting we have is one more checkbox called Compress Based on Peaks. And that is not checked by default, and I wouldn't normally check it. I've played with it a little, and I can see the value. So basically what it does is um, it will base the threshold and gain adjustments on the peak value of that waveform rather than the RMS value, which is the default. 
Uh, so what happens is when you're using the RMS, which is the default, the compressor uses a downward compression, making louder sounds above the threshold quieter while leaving the quieter ones below it untouched. When using peak values, upwards compression is applied, which makes the audio louder, but amplifies the louder sounds above the thresholds progressively less than those below it. So that's everything we have on the settings. I would normally then just hit OK, let it do its thing. So in my opinion, I don't think there's a catch-all sort of setting that you could just use and say this should be great for everything. It's going to depend a lot on your own tonalities, uh, your speed, your fluctuations. Are you Do you go from highs to lows and come in like this? Do you speak fast and slow down? Do you have good background noises going on? Uh, do you have the heater running in the background? All kinds of things can affect that. And that's why I wanted to go into each of these settings separately to give you an idea what each of them does. I say start with the bass that I, I was showing and adjust from there based on you know how you hear them, how they sound to you. Put on some good headphones, as good as you can find, and that'll give you a lot better feel for how that is. Now there's just one last thing I'd like to touch on before we wrap up this video. You can see here I'm recording in a stereo. Well, there's a little bit of controversy, or at least a disagreement, I believe, in the YouTube world, at least, uh, whether it's best to use stereo or to use mono when recording. I personally come down on the side of recording in mono if you're just doing an interview or you're just doing, a, a, say, a, a scenario like this where I'm just speaking into the microphone and talking and I don't have anything dynamic going on. If I was recording music, sure, I would use stereo. But you're not going to see a noticeable difference with a stereo versus mono in a YouTube video when it's just somebody speaking. So what you're going to do is you're going to save a lot of space for using a mono track, it's half the data, as well as it's not going to sound any better or any worse in my opinion. Let's just do a quick test on that ourselves. What I'll do is I'll get rid of that. We'll do the same thing twice, hopefully as closely as I can. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. That's the stereo version. Now we'll switch this to mono. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. There we go. And so as to be comparing apples to apples, what we do is we'll make all of the same compression and background noise changes as we did in the originals. I will do those real quick, and then I will come back and test them with you. Okay, I'm back after that quick modification. You can see they've changed a little. Now what I'll do is play them from the beginning, and we'll see if you can notice the difference. This top one is stereo, it'll play first. The next one will be mono, it'll play next. So if you're listening with headphones, we'll see if you can tell the difference. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. So that was all there was to that. If you find that you liked the top one better than the bottom one, feel free to go that route. More power to you. Now that we've established that the stereo and the mono sound the same, at least to my ears, let's go in and make a few modifications to this mono one, and I'll show you how you can spice up your audio a little, um, just a few different little tricks. For instance, let's say you want a deeper more baritone voice. Let's say you don't like your voice, it's too too thin. What we're going to do is we're going to work on the mono one, leaving the stereo one the same, since we know it sounds the same. And then what we'll do is we'll hear the difference between the two and see, see how you like them. So I highlighted the entire mono track. And I'm going to come in, in this case, change the pitch. And all I'm going to do is make this a little deeper. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to take this to minus six. As you go up the, to the left, you're going to get it deeper and deeper. And as you go to the right, you'll get more, more trouble into it. So we'll just do that at six. It works good on my voice. Now let's listen to the difference between the two. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. So you can see my voice there sounds quite a bit fuller and quite a bit uh, deeper. I'll do Control Z to make that back how it was. We'll double check, make sure. Two three, back. testing one two three test. Yeah, so that's back how it was. Another good thing you can do is come into the equalizer. So we'll highlight our entire track. We'll come down to the equalization, and you can do these sort of on your own, or you can come down here and. So we could add a little bass this way. We'll bass boost it here, and if we want to add a little treble as well, you can't do it at the same time but you can come in and click a couple of spots like so and just drag them up. So let's add a little bit of treble as well. See if that sounds any better. You saw it spiced it up quite a bit. Let's see how the sound is. 
Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Now, to me, that sounds a little crisper, a little, a little punchier. So I like it better. If you don't, no big deal. Okay, so we're gonna come in here and do one last thing. We're gonna highlight it. We're gonna come up to the effects, and we're gonna come down here to the reverb. And this is gonna get you to sound like you're into some sort of a large stadium or something. And you'd probably want to bring the size down a bit. Let's show you what the preview looks like here. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Definitely sounds like you're in the bathroom. So let's come down a little farther, see what that sounds like. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. You'd only use this on an oddball effect or something, and there's this, the, there's so many different uh, variations you can do on this. You'd have to play with them for days to ever figure it all out. I'll just hit OK here, just to give you a feel, so it would sound a bit like this. Here's before and after. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. So those are a few uh, cute little tricks that you can use. I think everybody's aware of the fade out. I guess I could show you that one time super quick. This is just fading it out. If you needed to fade together with something else, very simple trick. You can see it brings it down like that. Well, that's all I really got for you today. I hope some of that helped. I hope you picked up at least some little trick to help you along the way. Uh, good luck. Hey, did you remember to subscribe?